time we pray for all the volunteers of our armed forces we pray father for the danger that you would watch after them and the danger that they're in and the danger that they face and have faced and many have paid the ultimate price that we could assemble as we have this morning and this evening to worship Father, we're grateful for their service, and we pray that you would watch over them, especially those that are, been, that are in harm's way. We pray for them and pray that you would keep them safe, that they be done well, and they could return home as soon as possible. And Father, along with that, we pray for all the leaders throughout the world, and we pray that they could come together in some way compromise 
give a little and take a little so that the fighting can be brought to a close. And that we can all have the best opportunity to live in peace. We pray, Father, for our nation. We pray for our leaders in this nation and all the way down to each city. We also pray that the decision they make would be beneficial to the population. And it would also bring us together so we could also live in peace and love one another. And we pray, Father, as Christians, as we go about in our nation and around the world, as we travel, that we would be a beacon, a light that shines, that causes people to take notice, that would open opportunities for us to teach. And we thank thee, Father, for the church that you established throughout the world, but especially in our community here. And we pray that all the churches here, the churches of Christ, would be a bright beacon in this community. We work together to make sure that we get the message out to everybody and spread out as we can. Father, we continue to pray for all of our sick that's in our sick list and was mentioned this morning. Pray for them and we pray, Father, that it be thy will that they could regain their health or some of their health. And we thank thee, Father, for the one that has. And Father, we know that we all fail thee. We don't do the things you've asked us to do in, in cases, and we do things that you've asked us not to do in other cases. We stand before thee now, Father, praying that you would forgive us of those things. And we pray as we come together as we have on this Lord's Day and each Lord's Day in the middle of the week, through our study and association with good people, that we would grow strong in our faith and sin less. We thank thee, Father, for Tori and his desire to teach the word. Pray that he, you will continue to bless him with good health and desire to do that. And we pray as a congregation we can support him as much as we can. We pray for the leaders here at the North Side. We pray that you would be with us as we struggle to do your will, to discuss and try to do things that would encourage people not only to grow, but to obey the gospel. Pray, Father, if it be thy will, that you bless our work here, bless our efforts, and encourage all that's here to give it their best in working for thee. Be with us in this worship service tonight. May we listen carefully to what is said. And we pray, Father, that it will edify us and encourage us. This coming week, we ask these things in thy son's name. Amen. Let's pray tonight to take the Lord's Supper. Let's turn to page 12. It's in the first, third, and fifth stanzas in the chorus afterwards. <coughs>
Songs, page 272, the invitation song. And after you have that mark, turn to page 544. How I love to proclaim it, reading by the blood of the Lamb, reading through His infinite mercy, His child is forever I am. Reading, 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 reading by the blood of the Lamb, reading, 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 reading His child is forever I am. Reading and so happy in Jesus, no language for Dumb or deaf 
or the seed or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of whom of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall, and he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mile, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. <laughs> I apologize for that. I, um, usually for our scripture reading, I go off of the bulletin, and so that's going to be our scripture reading. But on the sermon guide, it has a more lengthy reading, and so instead of reading all of that text, I just wanted everybody to know that we're going to be covering that text, but for the reading itself, we'll go, go with the bulletin. So that, that's my fault on that one. I apologize. Uh, good evening to everybody, and uh, glad that we're all back tonight to worship our Father a second time. It's a tremendous blessing to be here again. On uh, Sunday nights, we've been going through uh, books of the Bible, and uh, we've been going through the book of Exodus for a few weeks now, and uh, we are now at the point where Moses is being called to his great task, where he's going to do his greatest life work in bringing the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, out of bondage, into freedom, into the promised land, or at least to the border of the promised land for Moses. Uh, and we can associate with Moses. Last time we talked about this interaction at the burning bush and what a tremendous event that must have been and a sight to behold and an experience for this man who had been a shepherd for over 40, about 40 years. And so Moses going about his everyday life encounters this burning bush and forever his life will be changed. Now it's full of purpose and he's now going to be on a divine mission for God. Not all are called to be official leaders in the Christian religion. But we are called to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. All of us are called to that if we are called Christians. Christians have been called to a life of challenge and difficulty. Oftentimes, preachers of old have said, we haven't been called to a padded pew, but rather to a splintered cross. Christianity is not a religion of comfort. Often we are put in situations where we are called to be very uncomfortable in the things that we are expected to do. And we talked last week, last Sunday morning, about the cost of discipleship, how we have to put Jesus above everything, our own lives, our families, and above our things. And so the Christian walk is a life of challenge and difficulty, and often times in the Christian walk uh, when we become afraid of the tasks that are before us because of they're difficult or whatever it might be, when we become afraid, we tend to make excuses, don't we? We make excuses for not doing the things that we should, not doing the things that Christ has called us to do because of the fear, whatever it might be. I'd invite your attention to Luke chapter 14, uh, and we'll look together here at verses uh, 16 through 24. Uh, Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 24. It's very interesting, and I, I was listening to a sermon by Brother Guy Woods last week or the week before, and he made a comment that really has, has kind of been haunting my, my mind, and as I was preparing for this sermon, I couldn't help but think about this. Uh, Brother Woods made the point that in most of the judgment parables of Jesus Christ, when he was talking about the end times, when the righteous will be separated from the wicked, the wicked unto eternal destruction and damnation, the righteous unto eternal life, and most of those parables, people are not, the, the, the wicked who are cast off are not sent there because of bad things that they've done necessarily. Some parables paint that picture. But it's not so much of bad things that individuals have done, but rather things that they failed to do that were right. And that's something that we have to take very seriously. So look here at Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 24. 
And a certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And so there's this great feast that's prepared, and invitations are sent out. And the reference here in this parable is inviting people to come to Christ, into his kingdom, into the church, to experience eternal salvation in his body. But this first person uh, had an excuse because he just bought a new piece of property. He must go tend to that property. And so he has to be excused. Verse 19 says, And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and have to go prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. So he made an excuse to go tend to his oxen. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. I have family responsibilities. Oh, I can't come to you right now. So that servant came and showed his lord these things. When the master of his house, being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So here in this parable, we see that those who were initially invited, come into the kingdom, and this primarily has application to the Jews, God's covenant people, the very people we're reading about here in the book of Exodus. They had rejected Christ, right? They had various excuses for not coming into the kingdom, but so Jesus did what? He went out to those who were sinners, those out on the highways, those who were maimed and appeared to be weak, and they decided to come. But here in this text, we, we learn that people tend to make excuses for not doing the things that Christ has called us to do. And so with that in mind, we now come back to Moses, and we learn that Moses is now going to appear as very, a very human individual. We oftentimes paint Moses as kind of a superhuman because of the great things that he did for God. But he was a human like the rest of us, and I, I think that most of us can associate with where Moses is coming from as we see the excuses, oftentimes we call them, of Moses. And I've entitled this sermon, God's Answers to Man's Excuses. We're going to see a few excuses that Moses is going to set forth to God as a reason for not doing the things God wants him to do. And God is going to respond to him every time. And I think there's a lot for us to learn as Christians in the New Testament era from the, this interaction. And so let's look together, first of all, at verse, beginning at uh, verse 11 of chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. The first excuse, if you will, and we can cut Moses a little more slack on this first one because we can understand where he's coming from. Remember, this is a shepherd. He's been doing the same thing for 40 years. And all of a sudden, Almighty God is speaking to him out of the bush. He knew about God, but he didn't know him in his fullness. And now he's being called to do a tremendous task. And so Moses is wondering who he was. He asked, who am I to carry on this task? Verse 11 says, And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Remember what he's asking him to do. That'd be like God asking one of us today to march into some Middle Eastern country with a hostile government and go face to face with their leader and request that something be done on a political stage. There's no worries about it. It's a very uh, fearful thing that God is asking Moses to do. And so we can understand how Moses might be a little apprehensive about the task that God has set for him to do. And so uh, Moses perhaps... Uh, lacked the intimacy with, uh, perhaps Moses struggled with his identity. Perhaps he wasn't comfortable with who he was and his own abilities. Uh, he didn't feel qualified. Uh, perhaps he thought God picked the wrong person. Moses asked, who am I to do these great things for you? And then Moses said to God, uh, and he said, certainly I will be with God, in verse 12 rather, and, and God said, and certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And so Moses' excuse was that he struggled with his identity. He didn't think that he was up to the task to do the thing that God had asked him to do. Now, if we kind of put ourselves in his shoes and bring this to the modern era, what questions and excuses do we sometimes make when God calls us to do something? We have the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, right? And... We also have the charge as the church to be a public witness in the world, to be salt and light, be a witness to what Christ is doing in the world. We are his, his body. And so we're a witness to the truth of the gospel. And 
it's understandable that we may ask the question, well, who are we as mere human beings, mere mortals, imperfect people, to carry on this perfect purpose and serve this perfect God? It's an understandable question. Who are we to carry on his work? And we struggle with that. We struggle with being imperfect people carry on, carrying on a perfect message. I can't tell you how difficult it is for me to, to put together a sermon and to preach it because it, it, inevitably, I think all preachers who are honest feel a sense of hypocrisy because you know, we're up here trying to preach a perfect message knowing full well that we're not perfect people. And it's difficult. And so there's that tension there. So we can understand how Moses could say, who am I? Because we ask the same question sometimes. So, who am I? God's answer, it doesn't matter who you are. Because I'm God, and I'm with you. That's the answer to that question. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter you and your imperfections, Moses. It doesn't matter that you have a, a bit of a temper. It, it's not about you. It's not about you, Moses. And it, guess what? It's not about us. It's not about us in and of ourselves, our inherent powers. God says it doesn't matter who you are because I'm going to be with you. It's interesting in the Great Commission, what does Jesus say at the very end? And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. <coughs> Jesus promises to be with his disciples. He is with us. He dwells here with us. We are, as the church, the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is with us. And if that's the case, it doesn't matter so much who we are. Our imperfection is sort of fading to the background. We are to be doing his work because God is indeed with us. I'd like to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 very quickly. Uh, we've been looking at this passage on uh, Wednesday nights, but look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse uh, 10. Uh, Paul understood this. He understood it wasn't about him. He understood it wasn't about uh, how great he was or how, how his diligence it wasn't about that because he realized he could only attribute all of his success as a missionary to God and the grace that was working through him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. Uh, he, he's describing here, leading up to these verses, that he labored more abundantly than all the other apostles. He was called in a different way, but he did more for the Lord. He covered more ground than all of the other apostles. But lest they get the wrong idea that he was bragging, he says this in verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. It's amazing what it will do for us in our service to God when we stop viewing things from a self-centered point of view. It's not about us and our imperfections. It's about what God is doing through us. God has shown grace to us in the church, has he not? He's bought us from the realm of sin into the realm of the saved. And his grace is working through us. And the sooner we realize it's not about us, the sooner we'll be willing to live the soul-saving life that God wants for us. So Moses' first excuse was, who am I? God tells him it doesn't matter so much who you are as it matters that I'm with you. So that's excuse number one. Now look at verse 13. And... Here in verses 13 through 22, really, this whole section extends. Moses asks the question, or, or rather sets forth the excuse, well, who am I going to tell the people that you are? First of all, who am I? But secondarily, God, God, who are you? Who are you, God? Notice here in verse 13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Who are you, God? Moses perhaps didn't have that intimate relationship with God yet because he, he hadn't known God on a personal level. He had maybe heard stories about him passed down from his family and perhaps from his father-in-law Jethro out in uh, the wilderness of Midian. But perhaps he, didn't, he, he lacked intimacy with God and he did not know God well enough to describe him to the people and perhaps lacked some convictions about God. And you see that the correlation, if we're not convicted and know God ourselves, it becomes very difficult to explain him to somebody else, right? It becomes very difficult to explain him uh, to somebody else. Uh, we, as Christians, sometimes fail to have the words to describe who God is because of his splendor and his greatness. We've been talking about his attributes, his absolute holiness and goodness and love. It's hard to describe in human words, human language, that type of being. 
It's very, it's very difficult. And sometimes we wonder how in the world we could describe God uh, to the people that we're trying to reach. Well, how does God respond? First of all, one of the most profound statements in all the Bible, which unfortunately we're not going to spend a lot of time on, because we spend a lot of time on it when we're talking about the nature of God and the names of God. God says, I am that I am, or I will be who I will be, indicating his eternal nature. He just is. That's his name. I am who I am. And he said, uh, continuing in verse 14, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. There's a lot packed in that short verse about the nature of who God is. And so he says, I am that I am. He's the eternal one. But also he connects himself with being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob here in verse 15. And God said, moreover unto Moses, uh, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord, of thy, the Lord God of thy father is the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. And so he connects it with being the God of the father, the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then he also tells them what he's going to do for them. He says, I am who I am. I'm the God of your forefathers. And guess what? I'm the God who's going to deliver you out of this awful situation that you're in. And that's what he essentially says to uh, the rest of these verses uh, through verse 18. So he tells them about his nature. He tells them about his personal connection with their nation, being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he also promises them that he's going to be their deliverer. He tells them what he is going to do for them. So considering that, what is God's answer for us when we make the excuse, well, who are we gonna, what are we going to say to our friends and our family about who God is? Well, we need to tell them about God, his nature, like he did to Moses here. We need to uh, tell them about sin, and we also need to tell them about that there's a deliverer, that he is already on the cross to deliver people from their sins if we will obey him. Do you know the best way that we can tell people about God today, about what he's like? His nature. We point people to Christ. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter one uh, very quickly. Hebrews chapter one verses uh, two and three. Jesus is the perfect revelation of what God is all about, about His character, His nature, and His attributes. They didn't have that information. They didn't have that fullness of revelation in the Old Testament era. The Old Testament was all looking forward to the Christ, and in the New Testament era, we're told that God dwelt in flesh. He tabernacled among men, John chapter 1 and verse 14. But there's something very interesting that the Hebrews writer tells us here in the very beginning of uh, this epistle. Notice Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3. He's talking about how that God, who at sundry times and a diverse manner spake in the times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, the Christian era, uh, spake unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds. And so God speaks to us today through his son. He's the ultimate revelation of God. But notice in verse 3, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Focus in on that phrase, the express image of his person. Your translation might say something a little different, but... Uh, it's important that we understand what's being said here. That term, uh, some translations have said it's the express image of his person, the very image of his substance, the exact imprint of his nature, the exact representation of his nature. It's actually the original, the, in the original language, the word is where we get the word character. And the idea is, underneath a tablet, when the, the Greek and the Hebrew children were learning their alphabet, you you put the kind of the stencil or the engraving beneath it, and what they would do to try to learn how to write those characters is they would try to perfectly emulate what was underneath that thin piece of paper and learning how to write the letters, the characters. They were trying to perfectly copy what was underneath. And that's exactly what Christ did. He's an exact copy. If we want to know what God is, we look at Christ. He's the perfect manifestation of who God is. So he's the precise reproduction of of God in every aspect. And so when we understand that, we realize that if we're going to tell people about God, and people want to know who God is, they want to know about this God of the Bible, we could say a lot of things about him, but ultimately it comes down to understanding who Christ is. And we show people who he is by teaching them about his word, learning about his nature, but also modeling the lifestyle in front of them. 
When we live for Christ, we're not displaying what God is like to the world around us. My, in studying this, I couldn't help but think that perhaps in our evangelistic methods, we need to be more and more focused upon the teachings of Jesus in particular. All the other things are important. But really focus in on what Jesus taught and how he lived and how he served, because that's ultimately how we learn about God. And so a person who knows God will be eager to tell others about him, right? When we don't have confidence that we know who God is, it's going to be difficult to have the conviction to want to tell others. But someone who truly knows God and gets it, understands what God is all about and what he's really done for us, the grace that he's shown, that person is going to be eager to tell others. It reminds me of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, and that, those first six verses. He saw the, the uh, God on the throne there, and he was just so undone and unraveled, and uh, the coal, the angels brought the coal to his mouth and, and washed him. And, and after that, God says, I need to send somebody to my people. And he says, here am I, send me. Once we understand who God is and come to know God ourselves, we'll be eager to tell others about him. Moses, number one, excuse was who am I? Number two, they won't know you. But number three, it goes a little further now, and this gets into chapter four. They won't believe me. That's the excuse. So God has already assured him of various things about what he's going to do about how he's going to do it, about how he's going to use Moses to accomplish his purpose. But now notice here in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 through 9. In verse 1 it says, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. So, Moses basically is anticipating, he's trying to, you can imagine him visualizing himself, marching to the people, marching to Pharaoh, having to, to recount the things that God has just told him. And he's, in his mind, seeing them resist his message. They're, he's saying that they're not going to believe me, that I'm having this conversation. And in one sense, we sympathize with that. He wants some kind of proof, maybe, that the message is, in fact, from God. He wants some sort of assurance that the people are going to believe him. But he probably feels intimidated because he's worried about the people's reaction, right? And so Moses is worried about the people's reaction. Now, fast forward to the Christian era, do we sometimes do the same thing? We know the mission. We know the God that we serve. We know that he's called us to go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know the mission. We know who God is. But sometimes what holds us back from teaching others is we sometimes will say, well, they just won't listen. That group of people doesn't want the truth, or they, they don't want to hear it. And so what that does is that provides an excuse for us in our minds and seemingly justifies not evangelizing. And so that's exactly what Moses is doing here. He's saying they won't believe me. What's God's response? Well, basically, when I'm finished, they will listen. He gives Moses some various ways to prove that his message was from God. He gives him miraculous powers. And he goes on three, three different things, and we won't read all that, but basically he has Moses' staff cast on the ground. It turns into a serpent. Moses picks it up by the tail. Uh, for those of you who are afraid of snakes, I'm sorry. That's probably very difficult for you to hear. But he picks up the snake, and it turns back into a staff. So that's miracle number one. He also has Moses put uh, his hand into his, his bosom, into his clothing, pull it out, it's leprous. Putting it back in, it's now cleansed, miraculous. But then also he tells him if they don't believe those two signs, well, take some water out of the Nile River, I'm going to turn it to blood. And so God gives him what he needs to confirm that his message is in fact divine. And of course we know that in the Christian era, at this point in time, the miraculous era has ceased. But in the New Testament, uh, the message that the, God, uh, that the apostles preached was confirmed by signs and miracles. That was the purpose of the miracles. Look at Mark chapter 16 uh, in verse uh, 17. Just after Jesus gives the Great Commission, he tells them that there's going to be great signs that are going to follow what they're going to do. Verse 17, it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they'll speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so in the Old Testament era, God gave ample proof. He had not left himself without witness to prove that he had in fact spoken to Moses by the miraculous power. New Testament era, in the early church, the message was confirmed by miracles. The miracles were to confirm the revelation of the word. But today, in the New Testament era, like we just read in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God speaks to us through his Son, and we have the Bible. He has not left himself without witness, and really... The fact that we have the Bible, 66 books in its completed form, is a, is a proof that God's hand is involved in that. When you look at the, the, the doctrine of inspiration, how the, there's tremendous unity 
how this was written by 40 different authors across 1,500 years, and yet there's a perfect unity to the message. That would be impossible if God wasn't inspiring the process. You think about all the prophecies that are fulfilled, given in the Old Testament, hundreds of years later, over a thousand in some instances, of things exactly coming to pass as God said they would come to pass. That's a proof that our book is from God. So when we say, well, how are people going to know that our message is from God, we hold up the Bible and say, this is God's word. This is his inspired word. And if they won't hear that, that's on them. But God has not left himself without witness. In Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 27, God gives Jeremiah a very difficult charge. There are times in the Old Testament history when God tells his prophets to preach and to teach, even though God knows that they will not hearken to the teaching. Notice what God tells Jeremiah in Jeremiah 7, 27. He says, Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, the words that God had given Jeremiah, but they will not hearken unto thee. Thou shalt also come unto them, but they will not answer thee. You talk about a, a tough mission. Knowing that the message that you're going to preach not only is going to bring personal persecution and risk your own life, but knowing that it's not those people aren't going to listen. God has told you so. But he wanted them to know and to communicate the doom that was coming upon them. Very difficult task. There are certainly times that we as Christians uh, understand that our message will not be received. That's what Jesus was trying to communicate to us in the parable of the soils. All soils are not alike. Some soils are not going to be receptive. Some will be initially receptive, but it's going to be choked out. And, and there are, oh, there's only a certain portion that is the good and honest soil where the seed will take root and to grow in the way it needs to be. Jesus taught that to encourage us, lest we think that everybody would be converted upon hearing the truth. But I think it's wrong for us, and we need to be very careful in saying things like, well, these people just don't want the truth, and writing off a whole group of people as saying they don't want the truth and not taking it to them, or, or saying things that... Uh, like, they won't listen to me, or we don't have any kind, of, any kind of proof. We need to be very careful about that, considering Moses' excuse here and the inspiration of the New Testament. If we believe the message God has given has the power to save man, then we need to trust its ability to do so. It's not about us and our abilities. It's about God's word having the ability to break people's heart. Our job is to be a conduit. It's not, it's not all about us. It's about us being a conduit, bringing them in contact with what God has already said. We need to be more interested in scattering the seed like we've been called to do rather than being soil speculators. God has called us to scatter the seed. And so Moses' third excuse was they won't believe me. God's response, when I'm finished, they will listen. Fourth, God, uh, Moses makes the excuse, I am not good at talking to people, basically. I'm not eloquent. Notice here in chapter 4 and verse 10. So it's, 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 he gets further and further. And you can tell Moses is maybe getting a little more desperate and more desperate. Because God has answered all of his previous excuses, and now he's going to answer this one. Notice here in verse 10. And Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither hereunto, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. So Moses here is fretting because he had some perceived inadequacies about himself. He didn't think that he was eloquent enough to speak the type of things that God is asking him to speak. And the application is pretty clear for us. I think us, we as Christians oftentimes do the same thing. You know, we, we, we view ourselves as not being eloquent enough to remember enough Bible or uh, be able to think on our feet enough to talk to other people about the gospel. And those are understandable fears. You know, 25% or 26% of Americans, their number one fear is public speaking. And it's understandable that it's a fearful thing to, to talk to other people about the gospel, especially considering the nature of the things that we're talking about, sin and salvation, uh, heaven and hell. These concepts uh, have the propensity to maybe damage personal relationships with others. But oftentimes, we say things like that, and we make the excuse that we have perceived inadequacies, inadequacies therefore we absolve ourselves from responsibility. How does God respond? He basically said, well, guess who made your mouth, Moses? I'm the author of your mouth. I made you this way. Do you think that I'm going to ask you to do something that you're not capable of doing? Notice here in verse 11, the Lord said to him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. He's saying, first of all, I've made your mouth. I'm not asking you to do something you're not capable of doing. You can do it. Number two, you don't even have to think of the words. 
You don't have to come up with the words. This is not of your own creation. I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to say. I just need you to be my mouthpiece. That's what God is telling Moses to quench his excuse that he was not eloquent and he had perceived inadequacies. Let me think about this for a moment. The Bible teaches that God has equipped us with all things that pertain unto life and godliness, true or false. That's a true statement according to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. He's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He's given us all the tools that we need to carry on what he has asked us to do. He would never ask us to do something that we could not do. Mr. Bill made that point this morning in Bible class. He wouldn't ask us to do something we couldn't do. That's not the God that we serve. If that's true, consider the next statement. God has given us a great commission to go teach all nations, true or false. That's true. We're commanded to go teach. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, he, he teaches them that they need, need to go teach every creature. But also, notice Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. Because in this text, the Hebrews writer is really kind of coming down on the people for not growing to the point where they could teach others. And we, have, uh, and we would do well to heed the, the warning that uh, the Hebrews writer gives these particular Christians that he was writing to. Hebrews chapter 5, and beginning in verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. The Hebrews writer says, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of age. Uh, even those who, by reason of their use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So, so first premise is God has given us all things pertaining to life and to godliness. He's given us all things to equip us to do the work that he set for us to do. That's true. He, of course, allows for growth. He allows for us to come along. But there reaches a point, according to the Hebrews, right, that you, know, you, you ought to be teachers. And so he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. He expects us all to teach. Therefore, we must conclude... Barring exceptional circumstances, that our unwillingness to teach and do the work of the kingdom is not a problem with our inherent abilities, but with our own attitudes and perhaps even our negligence. That's the conclusion I have to reach based upon these scriptures, if I believe what God has said. And so we need to think about that. Moses thought he wasn't good enough, thought he wasn't able to speak. We don't all have to be public speakers. That's not what God has called us all to do. That's not what we're saying. That's okay. Uh, but... Coming up with what to say, God gives us what we're to say. He's given us his word. Like I said earlier, we're just conduits. We bring people in contact with the word. We say, hey, look, read that verse. Well, what do you think that says? And usually people can see it very clearly. So it's not like we have to come up with all, we just have to point people to God's word. That's what God has called us to do in teaching all nations. We are conduits of truth. We point people to come in to understand the word themselves. Moses' fourth excuse was, I'm not good at talking to people. But lastly, now Moses really incites the anger of God. Up until this point, God was willing to bear with him, give him answers. No evidence of God being angry at all with Moses. But now, this last one apparently kindles God's anger. Notice here in, verses, uh, in verse 13, Exodus chapter 4. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. In the King James. Really, if you have a Another translation, it might read something like, Lord, please send somebody else. Something like that. He, that's what he's saying here. He's essentially saying, I, I can't do this. S send somebody else. You've got to have a better man for the job. That's Moses' last excuse. There has to be somebody else. Perhaps he felt inferior. Perhaps he even felt cowardly. And he wanted somebody else to do it. He didn't think that he was up to the challenge. Now, sometimes Christians... We have the temptation to kind of throw in the towel. Perhaps we're discouraged or whatever it might be. And we throw in the towel and we say, you know what, somebody else will do that. Somebody else will go teach that person. Somebody else will fill this need in the church. It doesn't need to be me. God has plenty of other people he can use. It doesn't need to be me. And sometimes we make that excuse. But this type of power is not acceptable in the kingdom of God. You see, Moses had kind of gone the way of Jonah. Moses here is not just making an excuse about his own inferiority. He's disobeying God's commandment. God is telling him what he's to do. He's not asking for suggestions or opinions, right? He's telling Moses, here's what you're going to do for me. And Moses, by saying somebody else needs to do this, is, is really disobeying God's commandment. Jonah did that very thing in a different way. 
He was called to go preach into Nineveh. Those wicked people, those Assyrians that had slain his kin, kinsfolk, he had a bitter hatred racially between the Assyrians and the Jews. And so he was very reluctant to want to go show God's grace and opportunity for repentance to those people. And so when Jonah was called to go to Assyria, he went in the complete opposite direction. He caught the first boat to Spain, and he was going the far opposite way. If you look on a map, he's going literally the opposite direction from Assyria, disobeying God's commandments. But God had to teach Jonah a lesson. A great storm came, cast Jonah overboard. Jonah was swallowed up by a great fish, and he learned quite a lesson in the three days in that fish's belly. God was patient with him, but he had to teach him a lesson. Finally, Jonah got it, and he went and did God's bidding. He wasn't happy about it, but he did it. And Moses is going to do the same thing. God is patient with people. He's willing to teach us lessons. But nonetheless, he expects us to keep his word. What's God's answer for us here? We serve a merciful God who works with us in our weaknesses, doesn't he? Again, if it were left up to our inherent abilities, the, the, the whole plan of salvation would have failed. It's just God working through us. The whole Bible pictures God, the perfect God, working with imperfect man to bring about his purposes. And so, with that in mind, we think about the songs that we sing. The songs, the Lord will make a way for me. Do we believe those words? The Lord will find a way for me. Do we believe it? Do we believe those words? If we commit ourselves to doing his bidding, the someone else excuse will never work. God wants us. He's called us to be Christians. And nobody else can be a Christian for you. We're all individually accountable before God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. So may we all, as Christians, learn from these excuses of Moses and how God responds to these excuses of Moses. By the way, that last one, God works with him, doesn't he? He said, okay, I'm angry. I'm angry, but I'm, I'm going to help you out. I'll give you your brother. I'll give the words to you. You give the words to your brother. He'll speak into the people. If, you're so, if, if, it's, if that's the problem. And Moses was able to go, and we're going to learn as we go through the book of Exodus what he was able to do for God. God worked with him in that circumstance. But nonetheless, he was angry. But may we all, as Christians, courageously go forth in our Christian walk Remembering these excuses, remembering it's not about who we are, it's about who he is and what he's doing through us. We need to remember that God is ever-present and is everything that we need. He's always with us if we're living for him. He's with us. We have that promise. We have to understand that not all will hearken to God, but most will listen and learn about him. Most people want to know about God, even if they're just curious about the God of the Bible. They'll listen to you. We may not be the most eloquent, well-spoken, well-versed person on this earth, but we have the ability to communicate God's word. If you know enough to be saved, you at least know that much, and you can teach that to somebody else. And so may we all have the courage to go forth in our Christian walk remembering these things. God will provide us the help with our difficulties along the way, but he still expects us to go. It doesn't absolve us from responsibility. So we learn many great and powerful lessons from the book of Exodus, from this example that we have in Moses. We're so thankful for God's mercy and his working with Moses, and we learn a lot about God from that interaction. And I'm so glad that he works with us, he gives us patience. We know that every day that we have to live, every day that God allows his creation to go forth, is a sign of his long-suffering and mercy, because he wants all to come to repentance and come to a knowledge of the truth. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. If we extend the Lord's invitation, we realize that Christ has paved the way for us to be saved. He wants us to hear his word, believe it, repent of sins, and confess them and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. If anybody here has not done that, if you haven't become a Christian, we encourage you and exhort you to do that. If you have become a Christian and you've gotten off the path or you've lost faith in God and perhaps you've made excuses in your faith and you're no longer serving him faithfully, if you need prayers with the congregation, we want to help you and we stand ready uh, to serve you and aid you in that way. Please, if you have any spiritual need, let me know. I have desired to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back.